for two members. We think they're on their way, so we're going to be adjusting the agenda a little bit, but nothing substantial because we want at least one or both of them here. So let me call the meeting to order by uh, reading that the North Carolina General Statute 138A-15 mandates that at the beginning of any meeting of a board, the chair shall remind all members of their duty to avoid conflicts of interest under this subchapter. The chair also shall inquire as to whether there is any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board today. Um, at this time, uh, is, are there any? We have a couple, three action items, I think, on our agenda today. Any voice of concern? If you realize later that maybe you should be recusing to yourself, you're still free to speak up at that time. So the record shows there are none at this time. Okay, um, before we proceed, let me welcome to my right, Richard Rogers, who is uh, our new division director for Division of Water Resources. We are glad to have you with us, welcome. Any remarks you'd like to make? I um, appreciate it, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and I'm excited to be back with the uh, with the department. Uh, I previously worked with the department uh, for about 15 or 16, 17 years uh, in different roles. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be back, uh, and I look forward to working with with the commission uh, in their efforts uh, as we move forward. Thank you. And I'll just say it's it's been a long time practice over the majority of the years that I've been on the commission that during the committee meetings, we have the uh, appropriate or most relevant division director sit at the table with us in case we need to ask questions quickly. And I've always found it to be very useful. So we thank you for doing that. And let me also extend our, our sincerest thanks to Danny Smith for his service as division director uh, during the years that I have been chair of this committee. He has moved to Dimler and is responsible for the very important new uh, funding that is coming in for stormwater management, and we wish him our very best. So, um, welcome, Commissioner Davis. Uh, we were just reading the um, General Statute 138A-15 regarding conflict of interest. Did you have any voice this time? No. None. You. Okay, thank you. So now we'll move to our meeting minutes. The meeting of March 9th this year. Have the commission members all had an opportunity to review those? And are there any revisions, corrections to the minutes? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Madam Chair, I. I reviewed the minutes and as is typically the case, they are very well done. I saw nothing. I move approval. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Duggan. Any further discussion about the meeting minutes for March? If not, all those in favor of approving, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <clears throat> Our first action item is a request approval to proceed with to the EMC with the 2022 Yakin PD River Basin Resources Plan. Virginia Baker with Division of Water Resources will be presenting. She is with our Basin Planning Branch. But before she begins, let me um, offer the opportunity for Commissioner Donna Davis to have some opening remarks. She served as the hearing officer is also a resident of that basin and the basin liaison for the commission. So, Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, I did have the privilege of serving as the basin liaison for the Yakimpedia River Basin. Um, there wasn't really a hearing, but there were public comments. Oh, excuse me. Yes, yes. you're right. Uh, that we did receive. But as we as we progress, I want to uh, first of all express thanks to Miss Virginia Baker, Karen Higgins, Robin Hoffman, and Michelle Riquette, uh, and all the staff that contributed to this effort. 
Uh, this comes directly from the executive summary of the, the basin plan. It says the North Carolina's basin wide water resources management plans or basin plans are a non regulatory watershed based approach to restoring and protecting North Carolina's water resources. Basin plans provide information on water quality and water quantity related issues, activities, and data analyses. They also identify areas that need additional protection, restoration, or preservation to ensure the waters of the state are meeting their designated uses. Basin plans are required under North Carolina General Statute 143-215-8B uh, and are approved by the Environmental Management Commission every 10 years based on session law 2012-200. The uh, 2022 Yakin PD River Basin Plan is the fourth document to be developed for the Yakin PD River Basin by the North Carolina Division of Water Resources. And at this time, I'm going to turn um, the meeting over to our presenter, uh, Ms. Virginia Baker, Basin Planner for the Yakin, Re uh, Yakin PD River Basin uh, with the Division of Water Resources in the planning section and the Basin Planning Branch. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. I Thank always, you, Commissioner yeah. Davis, for the I always need reminding that we don't have public hearings on basin plans because it's not a rule. It's a planning document. So thank you for reminding me of that and welcome Jenny. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm very happy to be here today and good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present and we will get started. So I will be presenting some of the more important topics and issues in the plan and we are requesting approval to proceed to the EMC with the 2022 Yakin PD basin wide water resources plan. Could you please move your microphone closer? Thank you. Let me know if that works. Is that better? Thank you. Okay. All right. So a um, little recap on what Commissioner Davis just said, and also, as I said, thank you for the introduction. Basin planning is a watershed based approach to managing water resources, which considers the cumulative impacts of all activities across the river basin, both point and non point sources. And as per statute, basin plans are required every 10 years. And plans are not rules, but we do provide recommendations. So this is the fourth cycle plan. It's the first one that covers a 10 year span from 2007 to 2016. And in some places I used more recent data if it was available when I wrote that section. In other places I used older data for comparison purposes. The, there are 13 chapters in the plan. The first chapter maps out what's in the document. Chapters two through six are general chapters, which cover basin-wide information, and chapters seven through 13 are watershed chapters. Seven through 12 covers the six main Hockgate watersheds, and chapter 13 focuses on High Rock Lake. So I'm gonna provide an overview of basin characteristics. I'm going to discuss some of the potential point and non-point sources in the basin and what the current water quality condition is as of 2018. Um, then I'm going to focus in on the Rocky River watershed, a little bit on High Rock Lake, and I'm also going to discuss water use and availability in the basin. And I have some recommendations for these different topics, which I'll discuss throughout. And lastly, I'll do an uh, overview of the public comments. So the Yakin PD Basin is the second largest in the state. It covers over 7,000 miles in North Carolina. The entire basin covers uh, from the Blue Ridge Mountains where the headwaters are located in Southern Virginia to the coastal plain in South Carolina. The main stem of the Yakin PD has seven reservoirs that are used for recreation water supply and hydropower. There are 24 counties in the basin of which 14 of them have greater than 50% land coverage. So those 14 counties have land, greater than 50% of the land drains to the Yakin PD system. There are seven Huck 8 watersheds. The main ones are the Yakin River, Headwater, the Yakin River where High Rock Lake is located, the Lake Tillery PD River, the South Yakin, the Rocky River and 
PD River. The Lynch's River is primarily located in South Carolina. So the Yakin PD Basin covers three ecoregions. The northwestern portion is located in the mountains. The majority is located in the Piedmont and the southeastern corner is located in the Sand Hills region of the coastal plain. The main coverage types in 2016 were forest at 55%, agriculture at 24%, and development at 14%. From 2006 to 2016, there was a 3.7% increase in development, equivalent to 35 square miles. Population increased by 9.5% across the basin from 2010 to 2020. The Rocky River watershed, where the Charlotte metro area is located, saw the most increase in development. More than half of that occurred in the Rocky River watershed and also in population. Other urban centers include Winston-Salem, uh, Statesville, High Point, Th Thomasville, Lexington, and Salisbury, and other urban communities. So now I'm going to move on to those potential point and non point sources of pollution, starting with permitted facilities, which we have some information on. There are 32 major and 145 minor permitted dischargers in the basin, of which two thirds of the as built, which is shown on the heat map to the left, the permanent as built, is located in the Yakin River headwater watershed and in the Rocky River watershed. There are also over 600 stormwater permits, of which these are concentrated in urban areas. 22 of those are MS4 permits, and these are shown as the pink triangles on the map. There are 49 non-discharge and 31 residual management facilities, which there's 1,000 wastewater and solid waste applications between them. They're primarily found in rural areas. There are also 108 permitted animal feeding operations. So this next slide shows a breakdown of the permit types for those animal feeding operations. Um, cattle facilities are most common in this basin. They are primarily located in the upper half and they're concentrated in Eardale County in the South Yakin watershed where 40% of the permitted as built shown on the heat map is located. Swine farming is less common in this basin and it primarily occurs in the lower half of the basin. There's also one permitted wet poultry facility in Union County. So we know that um, agriculture, particular animal agriculture, has a significant presence in this basin. And to better understand it, we did a series of um, queries using USDA National Agricultural Statistical Service data. The queries that we did were for poultry, cattle, and swine, both the farm number and the number of animals. We did two types of queries for these, an inventory query, which is a point in time. It's a snapshot of what's happening. And we also did a contract production query, which is a portion of the livestock or poultry to be raised and delivered by contract that year. So these are different data items and they should not be added together. We also queried the number of acres that are treated with fertilizer and manure and the number of different crops types and also acreage totals for those crop types. Um, queries were done at the county level and cumulatively those are in the plan. The table shows the cumulative results for animal agriculture and you can see that from 2017, 2007 to 2017, there's been a decrease in animal agriculture. Although for poultry, there was a slight uptick from 2012 to 2017 and there were increases in some counties. So as a visual tool, we mapped those animal numbers and those acres treated with manure and fertilizer. This first slide shows the poultry results. Um, poultry was most common in the upper and lower parts of the basin in Wilkes, Surrey, Union, Anson, Montgomery, and Richmond counties. Um, these six counties alone accounted for 84% of the inventory and 89% of the production contracts. Inventory is on the left and contracts are on the right. So 
So the map for uh, cattle using USDA data was comparable to the distribution of where we know our permitted animal feeding operations are located with higher numbers in the upper part of the county in Surrey, Wilkes, and Iredell County, particularly in Iredell County. For uh, acres treated with fertilizer and manure, the acres treated with fertilizer tended to be highest in Surrey, Rowan, and Union counties. Um, these counties also had the highest number of harvested crops. For acres treated with manure, um, these were highest in Union County in all of the survey years. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about water quality condition across the basin, starting with a summary of the 2018 integrated report. Um, in 2018, uh, we had over 6,000 miles of classified streams, but I'll point out here that we actually had monitoring data on less of those, less than half of those freshwater miles. So those are the rivers, the creeks, and the streams in the basin. We do have monitoring data in 2018 on most of the freshwater acres, the lakes and the reservoirs. For the monitored um, water bodies, there was 28% exceedance for freshwater miles and 79% exceedance for freshwater acres. This was equivalent to about a third of the assessment units. And this included both those AUs or water bodies that were on the 303D list shown as red on the map, and those that had a TMDL or some other type of mechanism shown as pink on the map. This next slide shows a breakdown of the 2018 integrated report by parameter. The most common impairments were due to biological communities to freshwater miles. Um, this was particularly the case in the Charlotte urban metro area in the Rocky River watershed. Other common impairments to freshwater miles were due to turbidity, metals, fecal coliform, and dissolved oxygen. Common impairments to freshwater acres were due to chlorophyll A, PCB fish tissue, pH, and turbidity. In 2018 was the first year that all seven reservoirs along the main stem had impairments. So for biological monitoring, um, biological communities are highly sensitive to changes in water quality, and they can reflect what's happening on the long and the short term. Stations are monitored on a five-year cycle, and they're often revisited. Uh, the slide here shows a subset of those stations that were visited in 2006, 2011, and 2016, and there was some variability in the results in these years. The table on the bottom right shows the number of stations that were visited in 2007, 2011, and 2016. And what I want to point out here is that we had um, a, a greater than 50% drop in the number of stations visited between 2006 and 2016, and that was due to a loss of funding and a cut of staff positions. So the next set of slides is going to focus primarily on the ambient results across the basin, starting with turbidity. I'll take a moment on this first slide. So. The map on the left shows the percent exceedance for data collected from 2014 to 2018 at the ambient st stations along rivers and creeks systems. And so these stations are monitored on a five year cycle. And this is percent exceedance over the 50 NTU standard for turbidity. So it basically shows you where there are hot spot areas for turbidity. The map on the right is the integrated report results for turbidity. It includes those river and creek stations, and it also inc includes the lake stations, which are monitored on a five-year cycle. Looking at the two maps, we can see that there were problem areas along the Rocky River main stem, along Brown Creek, uh, the upper half of High Rock Lake, some of the tributaries leading into High Rock Lake, and in the South Yakin, and also below Winston-Salem. These problems occurred in both urban and rural areas. 
The graph on the bottom shows a percent exceedance for these ambient stations collected at rivers and creeks and streams from 2004 to 2019. Overlaid on the graph is discharge from a USGS gauge that's located about 19 miles above High Rock Lake. It's the Yakin College, College at Yakin River gauge. So it's the gauge that's most centrally located with the least amount of regulation. It does give you an idea of what the discharge was for that year. At the watershed level, the Rocky River watershed and the South Yakin had comparatively the highest percent exceedance. Okay, so this next slide shows the fecal coliform results. Um, the map on the left shows the exceedance rate from 2014 to 2018 over the 400 colonies per milliliter standard. The map on the right shows the 2018 integrated report, and you'll note by the pink coloring that most of the impairments were had a category 4 TMDL. A number of these are older impairments, and if you compare the two maps, it would appear that we should have more impairments for fecal coliform. And that's because the data that was collected for the map on the left is considered to be screening level data. Five and 30 tests were not done. That's what's required to list a water body on the 303D list. So it's likely if we did these 5 and 30 tests, we would have more impairments. We tend to prioritize those for class B recreational waters. There were problem areas for a fecal coliform in the South Yakin watershed, the upper part of the Rocky River main stem, some of those tribs leading into High Rock Lake, uh, when, um, Salem and Muddy Creeks below Winston-Salem, and these occurred in urban and rural areas. At the watershed level, the Rocky, the Yakin, and the South Yakin, particularly in recent years, which it's been going up, had problems with fecal coliform exceedances. So for dissolved oxygen, we had fewer impairments. Uh, these tended to occur in the lower part of the basin, which is where the Triassic region and the Carolina Slate Belt region are located. These are known for low flows during warm seasons. Uh, there were impairments along Brown Creek, an older impairment, which has a TMDL, uh, Marks Creek, uh, a couple impairments in the Rocky River watershed and Polcat Creek in the Lynch's River watershed, a new impairment. For pH, six of the water bodies along the main stem are impaired, and two of the lakes in the Rocky River have impairments. For a temperature, uh, there are three lakes with impairments, Kerscott, a trout water in the upper part of the basin, and then two lakes in the Rocky River watershed. So for chlorophyll A, there are 10 lakes and reservoirs with impairments, including five along the main stem, four in the Rocky River watershed, and one lake, Tom Alex, which is located on a tributary to High Rock Lake. For PCB fish tissue, in 2008, Stanley County officials requested that a special study be done on Baden Lake due to the history and proximity to Alcoa. This resulted in Baden Lake being impaired in 2010. A follow-up more in-depth study of the lower Yakin PD system resulted in High Rock Lake and Lake Tellery being impaired as well in 2014. So for nutrients, since we do not have a standard for nutrients, the 75th percentile was mapped to highlight those hotspot areas for data collected from 2014 to 2018. And in looking at the map, there are problem areas along the main stem of the Rocky River, Richardson Creek, which we determined was likely due to an illicit point source charge discharge that stopped discharging in 2018. It had a very high nitrogen levels. Uh, Salem and Muddy Creeks in the headwaters of the Yakin River watershed, Abbott and Rich Forks Creek uh, tributaries to High Rock Lake. The nitrogen signature of these water bodies does suggest that there is a primary point source causing these higher concentrations. At the watershed level, the Rocky River watershed had comparatively much higher concentrations than the other watersheds. So for the inorganic fraction of nitrogen, nitrite, nitrate, 
This was comparable to total nitrogen with the highest concentrations occurring in the Rocky River watershed and then high concentrations occurring in the Rocky River main stem, Richardson Creek, uh, the Tribs, Rich Fork, and Abbots Creek to High Rock Lake, uh, the south in the Yakin River headwater, um, Muddy and Salem Creeks. For TKN, the organic faction of nitrogen, uh, TKN tends to increase with biological productivity. It's generally correlated with discharge, suggesting a non-point source. Uh, it was highest in Polecat Creek, Lanes Creek, and Richardson Creek. And this is where Union County is located. And if you'll recall, this is where we also had high poultry numbers and a, and a high number of acres treated with manure. Phosphorus um, was comparable to some of our other nutrients with high levels in the Rocky River main stem, Lanes Creek, and below Winston-Salem, also Polecat Creek, and higher concentrations in the Rocky River watershed. So we have a couple recommendations to share related to monitoring. Um, there are a number of gaps where we do not have any information and we would like to add stations. And I also want to say that this is sort of like a wish list when resources allow. Um, we would like to add parameters to existing stations where it makes sense. We'd also like to expand the fecal coliform bacteria studies for determining water quality impairments and expand, some metal, expand the metals monitoring using dissolved metals standards. We'd like to increase biological monitoring and grow the algal monitoring program to respond more adequately to the increasing incidences of potentially harmful algal blooms. So in order to better understand what was happening in the Rocky River watershed, we did an analysis of the main stem stations. So these are shown on the map to the left from lightest to darkest, um, upstream to downstream. Uh, we did this for all the parameters. The results for total nitrogen are shown on this graph uh, from 2004 to 2019. These are the 75th percentile, which tended to range from five to 10. Levels were highest at that most upstream station. And also um, to highlight how high these levels of nutrients were in the Rocky River main stem, we compared those main stem stations shown in red on these box and whisker graphs to all stations collected at Piedmont ecoregion, uh, ambient stations and rivers and creeks and streams. So a little bit of information on how to read these graphs, the cross and the plus are the mean, the line across the box is the median, the top of the box is the 75th percentile, the bottom of the box is the 25th percentile, and the whiskers are the extreme values. So the red boxes are the Yakin, excuse me, the Rocky River main stem, and the orange boxes are the Piedmont ecoregion. And you can see just from a glance that total nitrogen, nitrite nitrate, and total phosphorus had comparatively much higher levels of nutrients than the other ecoregion stations. TKN, the organic fraction, was a little bit more comparable. So the Rocky River watershed has many pollutant sources contributing to water quality problems. This we know. There are several other potential pollution sources that DWR has limited information on, such as urban and agricultural stormwater runoff, animal waste management, and failing septic systems. At this time, close to 50% of the monitored rivers, creeks, and streams, and nearly 80% of the freshwater acres, the lakes, are impaired. Over 300 miles, about a third of the monitored streams are exceeding criteria for biology, primary, primarily benthos, and four of the seven monitored lakes are impaired for chlorophyll A. Three rated as hypereutrophic by the North Carolina Trophic Index. These are the only three in the basin that had that rating. The majority of the Rocky River main stem is impaired for turbidity and much of it is impaired for metals. The Rocky River main stem and several of the tributaries have some of the highest levels of nutrients in the state. Nutrients from the Rocky River watershed are also affecting downstream water bodies, 
including Blewett Falls Lake, which was impaired for chlorophyll A for the first time in 2018. So, for point sources, um, we know that there are 25 minor and seven major MPDS dischargers in that watershed, of which several of them have requests or considerations brought to our modeling and assessment branch for expansions. And these are all discussed in the plan. There are also 156 stormwater permits, and 14 of those are MS4 permits. 14 of the 22 in the basin are in the Rocky River watershed. So we have one recommendation to share for the Rocky River watershed, and that's that water quality data indicates the Rocky River watershed is likely nutrient sensitive and in need of a comprehensive management strategy to address growing water quality issues resulting in degraded aquatic habitat and negative water quality impacts to downstream water bodies. DWR has identified multiple limitations with the current model that's used to determine the assimilative capacity for new and expanding point source dischargers that are renewing their applications in that watershed. It would benefit all entities involved if this model could be updated. The limitations to the model are outlined in the plan. Those include extending the model to the Rocky River confluence. So, I actually just have one slide to share on High Rock Lake, because I know you all have heard lots about High Rock Lake in recent years. Um, eutrophic conditions and water quality impairments in High Rock Lake have been concerning to state managers, government officials, and stakeholders in the High Rock Lake watershed for a number of years. Chapter 13 provides an overview of High Rock Lake, including a timeline for nutrient management activities. And we have one recommendation, and that's that DWR supports the nutrient criteria development process, which resulted in a recommended site-specific chlorophyll A water quality standard for High Rock Lake. DWR is actively engaging stakeholders in a collaborative process toward producing the least burdensome regulatory designs that effectively carry out its restoration responsibility for the lake. So now I'm going to move on to water use and availability. Um, in 2018, 72 systems submitted a local water supply plan to the division, and 157 facilities reported water withdrawals to the Water Withdrawal and Transfer Registration Program. There are also four IBT certificates in this basin. An analysis using data from the local water supply plan program and the water withdrawal transfer registration program found that 85% of the water demand is used for public supply systems. The rest of the water is used for industrial recreation, mining and the energy sector. However, this did not include agricultural data as there are limitations with that data set. So, the North Carolina Department of Ag and Consumer Services does provide an agricultural water survey. This is a voluntary survey. It's available publicly. However, in 2018, due to federal and state confidentiality laws, three of the hucks in the Yakin PD watershed did not provide information, and that included the Rocky River watershed, which is the second largest watershed in that basin. So, in 2020, a combined Yakin PD lumber oasis model was completed. Hydrologic models are a powerful planning tool that can be used to evaluate future water supplies, reservoir elevations, stream flow, and hydropower generation in river basins with growing populations and water demands. Uh, hydrologic models use different data sources to Build to be built, including historic USGS stream flow, surface water withdrawals, wastewater discharges evaporation rates, and management protocols. We have one recommendation to share related to water use and availability, and there are other recommendations in the plan. So, as per statute, DWR must assure the availability of adequate supplies of water to protect public health and support economic growth. However, there are data gaps, both with monitoring and reporting. DWR will continue to work collaboratively with federal, state, and local agencies 
as well as stakeholders that have an interest in water resources to identify some of the data gaps and where more information is needed. So we've got some recommendations to share related to non-point source and point sources of pollution. Again, there are other recommendations in the plan. We're recommending working collaboratively with MPDS permitting staff during the permit renewal process to ensure that dischargers are collecting appropriate effluent and in-stream data and focusing on operator education and oversight and inspection of minor package wastewater treatment plants to ensure proper maintenance and permit compliance. We're also recommending ensuring the oversight and permit compliance and management of large scale animal waste management systems to reduce non point source pollution and focusing on educational opportunities on nutrient management, BMP implementation, riparian buffers, and soil tests for private landowners. We also are recommending identifying new funding sources to hire additional personnel to promote BMPs and work with landowners to reduce pollutants. We are encouraging urban mitigative measures and supporting the implementation of existing sediment and erosion control local programs and local storm water control ordinances to reduce stormwater runoff. And we are encouraging land conservation with a prioritization on tracks along waterways with floodplains and wetlands. And we are also encouraging working with local, regional, and state resource agencies to identify and locate potential nutrient sources in the basin to adopt the basin wide stream monitoring program and identify new water quality monitoring stations, create a mass balance of nitrogen and phosphorus for the basin and target BMP implementation. So a recap on our public comments, we received over 200 public comments from 9 stakeholders and individuals. Um, we addressed as many of these comments as we were able to in the time that we had in our plan, and we plan to reach out to the commenters individually after the water quality committee meeting. So we had a pretty quick turnaround. It was a 30 day review time for the plan, and we added an extra week. Some of the commenters did express concern about the time that they needed to review the plan. We worked with them individually to extend their time. We value the comments that we receive from stakeholders. They enable us to craft better plans in the future and also improve the current plan that we are working on. So at this time, we're requesting approval to proceed to the EMC with the 2022 Yakin PD River Basin Plan. And I also wanted to give a quick thank or shout out to all the basin planners that worked on this document, the folks in our section and our division and even in our department and even outside of our department that contributed to the plan. It really is a collaborative effort and a lot of work went into it. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. And um, I'll begin by saying this was an extremely large effort. Uh, Jenny's leadership in this is shining and we uh, thank you for the thorough analysis. So this is a multi-year effort to produce a document like this in any of our river basin plans as well. So uh, before we discuss a motion, are there any questions for her or any comments about the plan itself? So a question. Um, in Union County in the Rocky River Basin, they are um, looking to build a new wastewater treatment plant. Um, in the county. Could you put the microphone? I'm sorry. Uh, have you have you had any conversations about that and any impacts that it, that would have on your analysis here? So, I'd ha I'd have to go back up to that slide. I don't know if that's listed on this slide. I believe that's probably going to have been brought to our permitting section, mm -hmm. and I would need to reach out to them to find out about that. So since the plan years focused up through like 2018, right. if that's something that came about after 2018, it, it may not have hit my radar. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it came after 18, but okay. just to kind of make you aware that I, I know that they're in the process of actually citing the, the facility uh, on the Crooked Creek. On which creek? Crooked. Okay. I don't think we have a, it's a, it's a minor facility? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, thanks for that. Any other members wish to comment? Madam Chairman, I, I do have a, a comment. Um, <clears throat> I've lived my whole life in uh, this basin, uh, particularly close to the Rocky River area. Um, I live in the town of Norwood. I grew up there and um, it was interesting to see uh, what's happening in our basin and how things are changing in some cases for the better, but unfortunately in a lot of cases for the worse. And so not just the division, but I would encourage us to encourage everyone, um, first of all, to take serious the recommendations that the staff has put forward, but to use this plan, it has a lot of information. And as we think about what we're doing as the people who, who live in this area, who depend on uh, this, this river basin and the lakes who enjoy uh, what this this um, this basin has provided to us that we use this as a tool. Uh, I think too often these basin plans are uh, a tremendous amount of effort goes into them and nobody looks at them until the next 10 years when this is presented again. So I would encourage everyone, not just staff, not just uh, the environmentalists or people who are, are who are intensely uh, engaged in this, but the public towns, counties, communities to use this resource that's been provided and um, to let's make this basin better in the next 10 year cycle, as opposed to uh, what we're seeing and the trend we're seeing now. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. I, I completely agree. Uh, this was also my home basin. I was born in Davidson County. My mother's family from Anson County. So I've lived in this basin, you know, the most, uh, formative years of my life. And so it has a very important role in my life too. And I agree completely. Uh, there are some very valuable recommendations coming out from this. And if it is possible, uh, we'd like to be able to track the recommendations to what actions are being taken in the different branches of the division to um, implement this, be it in the, um, the monitoring, which is seriously needed, more monitoring. Uh, cl uh, classifications, I see a number of recommendations for potentially uh, moving certain se stream segments to high water quality designations. Yes. Um, outreach and education, as Commissioner Davis mentioned, the Rocky River Nutrient Management Strategy that you're recommending and the need for modeling. So. All of these things, if we can have them itemized, maybe in a working table to track it to the responsible branch and uh, lay out a calendar for how they intend to um, address these, along with all of the other many things that they have to address, we understand. But to, um, to have some structure to following through and implementing on these recommendations, that would be great. Um, if, the, if there are no other commissioners with comments or questions, I, I did want to make one or two additional comments. So, um, the in Iredale County in particular, we refer to cattle as the uh, predominant livestock. It would be very useful if you have those resources in the future to break down the term cattle into beef cattle versus dairy cattle. Um, because that can make a big difference in nutrient loading potential. Yeah, we do have that information. Um, we did not do it in the plan, just a lot of work went into the plan. And, and, and my background is, you know, I was learning agriculture at the time, but that is something we could consider for the future. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe Iredale is still predominantly dairy. I don't know if that's the case anymore or not. I do not know offhand. Um, I, I had lumped them together when I did the analysis just for ease. Okay. All right. Um, of course, it, it's, it's clear looking at the general information about the basin that there's going to continue to be a significant population growth in this basin, as in other basins around the state, putting increasing pressures on our water quality and our water resources. Um, 
looking at the, the water resources portion of it or the water supply portion. I, I was on the commission back in 2007 when the interbasin transfer for Concord was approved. I continued to remain um, concerned about the impact on the Yadkin of withdrawing for Concord. Uh, I see that the majority of the withdrawal is coming from Yadkin rather than Catawba, even though they were equally, equally allocated in the basin transfer plan. Um, so I, I do want us to watch that closely to determine if there are continued impacts on the water supply for the Yadkin. We've been most fortunate in recent years not to have severe droughts, but as you say in your climate write up, um, there is increasing temperature. The heavy level of forestry and land coverage in this basin uh, will always put us at risk of wildfire um, and those impacts not only to water quality and land resources, but also air quality. So, absolutely. Uh, let's see, other things. Uh, the Carr Scott Reservoir, first time that it's being uh, identified as potentially facing eutrophication. Uh, that's a concern to me. It's a very historic reservoir for our state. It was built for flood control purposes back in, first approved back in the 1940s. And um, to have an, an upstream reservoir facing problems like that's a concern. So I, I hope we can try and pinpoint that. But of course, I think what comes through most importantly is the, the need for the nutrient management strategy in the Rocky River. and um, how we can begin to address and hopefully manage the, the increasing population growth and demand, not only through point source, but also non-point source, so. Yeah, Chris Scott, I didn't have time to talk about in the presentation, but that is a concern and we had recommendations in the plan. Yeah. It's, it, it's a system that appears to be changing. Good. But. okay. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? Uh, Madam Chair, yes, if, if I may, um, the the condition of the Rocky River watershed um, hit me as a wake up call. Uh, there are some severe issues here. I recognize that this is a planning document. It certainly has very um, very important data in it. But I wonder just. For my own edification, and specifically as to the Rocky River watershed, what lies ahead? What is is the desired effect or the likely effect of this report as to that watershed? Are our stream class classifications altered? Are discharge permits made to be more stringent? What what might lie ahead as to that basin? Well. Our first recommendation was to update the model that's used for any expanding or new. So, like Union County, as you mentioned, any new facilities or dischargers will be looked at more carefully, and that model will be more up to date and be able to address any expansions. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, these issues, you know, tend to be brought forward not from the top, but they're brought forward from the bottom up. So. You know, we may be the first group um, identifying and, and bringing this forward to the EMC. I know the modeling and assessment branch is aware of the issues in the Rocky River watershed. You know, as planners, you know, we can't make a recommendation without getting everybody on board for like an in-depth nutrient management strategy. And as we said in the recommendation, we recognize that that is something that's needed down the road, but that's going to come from our directors and support from other staff. Mm -hmm. So I, I know, um, I, I don't believe the Rocky River model was funded this cycle. Hopefully it will get funded on the next cycle. Okay. Yeah, we, we do hope that it will be addressed, but you know, it takes time and you, you took, it's taking a long time to address High Rock okay. Lake and I suspect the same will happen with the Rocky River Watershed. Okay. Thank you. Well, just a, a comment. This section of the report just strikes me as a, a strong suggestion <clears throat> of a call to action to do something about the water quality uh, and specifically in the Rocky River watershed. 
Thank you. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. If there are no other comments or questions, I, I think it's appropriate to ask Commissioner Davis as the liaison if she'd like to make the motion for next steps. Uh, Madam Chair, I move approval of staff's request to proceed to the EMC with the 2022 EAC and uh, PD River Basin Resources Plan. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Commissioner Carter. Any further discussion? If none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Our second action item is a request approval to proceed to the EMC with proposed reclassification of the tier quarry and a section of the Eno River to WS4 critical area. And this is in the New Stripper Basin. Um, Elizabeth Countess will make that presentation on behalf of the classification standards and rules review branch. Good morning. I am here to ask the committee to approve a request for a surface water reclassification in order to proceed to the full commission in July of 2022 for their permission to send the proposed reclassification out to public notice and hearing. The request received from Durham County is for Tier Quarry in a segment of the Eno River in Durham County. The Quarry and Eno River segment are to be reclassified from water supply for protected area or PA to water supply for critical area or CA because the city of Durham seeks to construct a new intake in the river, pump water from the riverine intake to the quarry and utilize the quarry's waters as a public water supply. Sorry, I just have a mouse problem. There we go. So tier quarry, which is shown as the green area in the center of the map on the slide, is located adjacent to the southern side of the Eno River, approximately five miles west of Falls Lake, and at the northern end of Denfield Street in Durham, North Carolina. The boundary of the proposed critical area for the quarry consists of the top of the quarry's berm which is the boundary of the green area on the map. There's that green area. The proposed riverine intake is located about 1.1 miles downstream of the US 501 bridge and at the downstream end of the proposed critical area for it, which is shown in the rose color um, on this map. There are no named tributaries to the river or quarry included in this proposal. The northeastern quarry of the, or excuse me, corner of the proposed critical area for the intake intersects slightly with the boundary of an existing critical area for an existing riverine intake, which is shown as the yellow outlined area on the map. Uh, the boundary of the protected area for the existing river and intake is also shown on the map as the orange outlined area. Sorry, that orange is not going to but here's that 
and protected area boundary for the existing intake. It also serves as the protected area for the quarry and the proposed intake. Lastly, beneath the existing intake's watershed is another water supply for protected area uh, as noted by the light orange port, um, area below that existing intakes right in here. Excuse me. Where, where is that? Yeah, so, so the yellow area is an existing critical area for an existing intake. This, all this light orange area in here is all its protected area. And then beneath the existing intake is another water supply for a protected area. It's lots of water supply, waters in this area. Water in the quarry will be used to help meet local water demands. Thus, the proposal serves the public interest per executive order number 70 and complies with the GS 150B, the Administrative Procedures Act. In addition, Division of Water Resources public water supply staff have no objections to the proposal. Furthermore, the Division of Water Resources staff worked with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission and City of Durham staff to come to an agreement in 2019 regarding the conditions pertaining to water quantity by which the City of Durham would be allowed to withdraw water for water supply purposes from the Eno River, as well as Lake Nikki and Little River Reservoir, and transfer those waters into the Tier Quarry, and secondly, use water in Tier Quarry as a public water supply. The waters to be reclassified also meet surface water supply water quality standards according to DWR studies conducted in 2021. Lastly, a finding of no significant impact has been issued for this project. This slide compares existing and proposed requirements in the proposed areas. Existing requirements are shown in the bottom row of the table and proposed requirements are shown in the table second row. If reclassified, restrictions associated with new development and new industrial process wastewater discharges would apply, and no new in landfills and no new residual or septage land application sites would be allowed in the proposed critical areas. These additional restrictions are shown in the yellow highlighted text on this slide. There are no permanent or planned wastewater dischargers and no known planned land application sites, landfills, or developments that would be impacted by the proposal, according to the Raleigh Regional Office of um, the Division of Water Resources and local government staff. The subject areas consist mainly of developed single-family residential areas. Durham County and the City of Durham are the only local governments with jurisdiction in the reclassification area and would need to modify their water supply watershed protection ordinance within the required 270 days after the reclassification becomes effective. Each of these governments has provided a resolution to the division and the purpose of a resolution is to indicate whether a potentially impacted local government will implement the water supply rules within its jurisdiction once a reclassification becomes effective. In addition, letters of no objection were received from the parties that are subject to the voluntary Eno River Capacity Use Area Water and Management Operations Plan, <laughs> uh, along with the City of Durham. Uh, and those parties are the Town of Hillsborough, or the Hillsborough's water system, the Orange Alamance water system, and Resco Products, which was formerly Piedmont Minerals. A fiscal analysis for this proposal, which has yet to be submitted to OSBM, shows a one-time cost of approximately $2,000 to the state associated with notification, review, and approval of ordinance changes. The analysis also shows a one-time shared cost of $8,000 to a shared cost of $8,000 to the City of Durham and Durham County affiliated with rezoning and ordinance text amendments. C 
Sampling of groundwater wells adjacent to the quarry has revealed the presence of contaminants from releases of petroleum, hydrocarbons, and chlorinated solvents associated with historical uses of the area. According to the most ground, recent groundwater evaluation, a January 2022 phase two remedial investigation, or RI, for which you see the cover page on this slide, levels of 1,4-dioxane exceeded its associated groundwater 2L standard in several intermediate and deep monitoring wells. Levels of vinyl chloride, naphthalene, and an estimated value of hexachlorobenzene exceeded their respective 2L standards in one each of separate intermediate wells. Lastly, levels of naphthalene, bis 2 hethyl exyl phthalate, and 2-methyl naphthalene exceeded their respective 2L standards in one deep well. Lastly, and I quote, given groundwater flow in the intermediate and deep zones is toward the quarry pit, the compounds detected are likely migrating toward the pit. And that is from this report. In addition, again, I quote, based on results of this phase two RI, ELMSS, which is the consulting firm producing the report, recommends continued annual monitoring at the site. Surface water monitoring points should be increased for the next monitoring event to confirm groundwater impacts are not affecting surface water in the quarry pit. In closing, I am here today to ask the Water Quality Committee to approve this request so that it may come before the full EMC, EMC in July of 22, accompanied by an OSBM approved regulatory impact analysis when EMC's approval will be sought to go to public hearing and notice. The proposed reclassification's effective date is estimated to be May 1st of 2023. At this point, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions from the committee members? Mr. McAdams. Just clarity on the on the um, action sought here. Are we um, being asked to resolve a recommendation to the EMC for um, the approval of the request? Does the approval of the request reside with us, the Water Quality Committee? This uh, is to go to the EMC. Okay. All right. In, I, I am happy to so move, Madam Chair. Well, um, let me, Commissioner Carter has hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. You said you're willing to move, so let me ask. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think I just have a quick question. I might have missed this before. But I assume this is an, an old and uh, abandoned, unused quarry, and the yes. town is simply proposing use it because it, it provides uh, a significant amount of storage. So that, that's basically what we're doing here. Yeah, the quarry ceased operations in the late '80s. Okay. And so, yes, at this point, it is used. It will be used to hold water for public water supply. Use. Okay. Thank you. Now, Commissioner McAdams. I, I am very impressed with the amount of coordination among the local governments here, and everybody seems to be backing this. I'm happy to move approval to take this request, uh, move that we recommend approval to the Environmental Management Commission. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Second for Mr. Carter. I will. Uh, Take the offer for discussion uh, to take this opportunity to ask a question or two myself. Um, but let me ask first: Do any is there any discussion from other members? Okay, I, I wanted to uh, learn a little bit more about the groundwater contamination and the analysis that said that the contaminants are moving toward the quarry. Uh, what steps will be taken to monitor? Will the county be required to monitor for these um, petroleum products and chlorinated organics? So, first of all, I am fortunate to have a representative here 
um, from Durham who can speak to what steps that they may take into the future. It's important to keep in mind here, this though is a surface water reclassification request. The waters do meet the water supply, water quality standards. So from that perspective, you know, we're talking about a classification request of those, of those waters. Um, so you would to come up, um, uh, you can address what steps the county may be taking. Well, given that the quarry is a hole in the ground, is it possible that the spring water will go into the quarry is what I'm, I'm getting at. So if it's migrating there. The, the, the quarry, you are correct, obviously is going to be getting some feed from groundwater. Um, but it is, in essence, groundwater turning, becoming a surface water. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, from the reclassification respect, we would treat it as a surface water. Thank you. Thank you. Would you please uh, identify yourself and your affiliation for our records? Hi, uh, my name is Sid Miller. I'm the water resources manager for the city of Durham's Department of Water Management. And the, the question was about, uh, will this city be monitoring for these organics? So at present, it's the responsibility of Hanson aggregates as the former owner of the property to monitor the groundwater quality and to determine whether there's any ongoing problem under, I, I think it falls under RECPA. Um, so they are doing so, they have done so. They, I believe they have over uh, 20 monitoring wells around that area. Um, they've also been monitoring the surface water. Now, as um, the proposed user of the water in the quarry, um, we monitor all of our water supplies a far greater frequency than is required by statute. Thank you. My other question, um, I, I think that's the only question I have for you, thank you, was about the, uh, the finding of no significant impact. This was performed by the state, is that right, as part of the uh, that an environmental impact analysis or environmental impact statement, the, the FONSI? Okay, so a little help on this one. Um, so the FONSI is rather, um, you might help me on this, it's rather, it's rather uh, old at this point. And since regulations though have changed, me if I'm wrong, some folks in the background, um, at this at at this point, um, I I don't think that it even is, is required. Okay, so this has been a very long project. Actually, I've been in discussion since I've been here over the last twenty years on this, and it has evolved quite a bit. Um, so I don't know if you want to come up and help me, but um, so basically, that that Fonzie is um, it's not done by the state, it's done by the party that is by the applicant the, the project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Want to speak any more to that? Or just yeah. say it's a, there was an environmental assessment that was conducted. It was, um, it was some time ago and the finding of no significant, it's, um, no significant impact was issued by the Department of Environmental Quality. Thank you. And the withdrawal from the Eno, that will not have any impact to the um, aquatic habitat of the Eno. Say that one more time. The withdrawal from the Eno to, for storage in the quarry, has, the, has there been any impact of uh, anticipated for the drawdown on the river? So this is Fred Tarver, He's, yeah. he does. Uh... Welcome Mr. Tarver. Good morning. Uh, my name is Fred Targer. I'm with Division Water Resources Basin Planning Group. Um, yes, there was a FONSI back in 2006 um, <laughs> for the uh, withdrawal from the Eno River into the Tier Quarry. And at that time, well, still, City of Durham is a member of the 
uh, voluntary capacity use agreement for the Eno River. And in that agreement, they're allowed to withdraw 10, 10, they're allowed to withdraw up to 5 MGD from the Eno River as long as 10 CFS is maintained downstream of the intake during most of the year, but if 30 CFS is supposed to be maintained in the river between March and May, so they can withdraw up to 5 MGD. And that's what the FONSI was allowing them to do to pump into to the, to the secure quarry. So that was just meeting the requirements of their capacity use agreement, but it's just for uh, pumping into the to the secure quarry. So this agreement, if when the state when the legislature changed the, the language of the SEPA um, statute back in 2015, it, it threw out the need for an environmental review for this process. So um, Durham carried on because of their. Um, the concerns of the city of Raleigh downstream because since the Eno and the Little and the Flat River all drain into uh, Falls Lake, the city of Raleigh was concerned about impacts to their storage. So we had a team get together to discuss the various components of the plan and uh, also included uh, the Wildlife Resources Commission because they also have some waterfowl impoundments that they pump water from the Flat River into their waterfall, waterfowl impoundment. So the city of Raleigh's primary concern, and we addressed it in, in, the, uh, in the regime, uh, is that the Falls Lake has to be at full pool or 251.5 before they can pump from the Eno River into the Chair Quarry. So that addressed the concern of the city of Raleigh. And it also met the needs of the Wildlife Resources Commission because it allows them enough draft in the Flat River to pump into their wildlife waterfowl impoundments. Another, another issue on the Flat River is Lake Mickey. At the time, uh, Lake Mickey did not have a minimal flow requirement, and DWR requested that at the part of this agreement that uh, Lake Mickey have a downstream flow requirement. Um, Little River Reservoir has a minimal flow requirement, and uh, and Eno River has that flow requirement as it contained in the capacity use agreement. So in order to pump from the Lake Mickey, they have to maintain their minimal flow requirement, but also main, uh, maintain an additional 11 CFS downstream before they can pump from Lake Mickey into the territory. For Little River Reservoir, they have to maintain their minimum flow requirement and, and uh, maintain an additional 20 CFS downstream before they can pump from Little River, River Reservoir into territory. Now, on the, on the Eno River, they have to maintain their flow requirement in the Eno as it's contained in the capacity use agreement up to 5 MGD, but they, they requested that they be allowed to do uh, higher flow skimming from the Eno. So the proposal was to um, they install a, a weir uh, set at an elevation that um, they can maintain their 5 MGD and maintain their flow by requirements, but when they exceed 5 MGD, they can only skim when they maintain the median annual flow of 49 CFS downstream, and then they can withdraw. Um, depending on the elevation of tier quarry, if it's, uh, I have to refer to, to the notes here. Um, So, if tier quarry is above 254 mean sea level, they can pump. Uh, what they have to maintain 90% of flow by above 49 CFS. So they can withdraw 10% of flow by as long as they maintain 49 CFS. Um, if the tier quarry is less than 254, they can uh, withdraw 20% and maintain 80% flow by as long as they maintain the 49 CFS. So from our perspective, DWR's perspective, that, that re uh, represented a condition that would uh, not significantly impact the Eno River and meet all the uh, parties' uh, concerns and needs. Thank you. Oh, it's a lot of information, but it proves that y'all have given this a lot of careful thought, yes. and, and we appreciate that. I just didn't see the information, you know, clearly in the 
package and I wanted to make sure that impact on the, you know, benthos and ecosystem was being protected. And it sounds like you've given it a lot of careful analysis. So thank you very much. So uh, we have a motion from Commissioner McAdams and a second from Commissioner Carter. Any further discussion on this motion? All those in favor say aye. Uh, no. Opposed? Motion carries. I thank everyone for their patience as I ask those questions. Third item on our agenda. Request approval to proceed to the EMC with revised new Centaur Pamlico new development stormwater local programs. This is presented by Trish Darconti, the Division of Water Resources, Nonpoint Source Branch. She's speaking on behalf of a number of uh, entities in the division, though, and we thank you for this. Um, just as a bit of background, we are looking at this as a, a first of two lists of program requests that are coming to us. These are for the existing programs. Um, We've considered whether or not to delegate decision making to the division, and at this point, we decided it would be better to at least see the first round of re program requests um, as a commission itself rather than automatically delegate it. After we think about what is involved in this review process and the um, the role of the commission can play. Uh, it, I will we'll let the um, water quality committee and the, the full commission with our, our chair Smith's leadership determine if delegation seems appropriate in the future. So. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you can hear me all right? Just a second. Okay. So today uh, I'd like to bring to you uh, our first set of new and Tar Pamlico new development stormwater local programs. Uh, this would cover, uh, we have a total in this first set of 23, and we wanted to cover the first 12. Uh, just a real quick review of the history of how we got to here. Uh, so the original new trans stormwater rules were adopted about 20 years ago. We had 15 local programs in the news to begin with, and we added, or we had 11 in Tar Pamlico. Uh, we added some with the new revision and readoption that happened in April of 2020. Now we have 30 programs in the news and 12 in Tar Pamlico. Four of them are in both of the basins. Uh, we had a new model program approved by the EMC in March of 2021, and that kind of started this part of the process. And what that means is that with the model program, the local, the local governments had their guidance in, in the form of a local program development guide. They had a model ordinance and they had a uh, model stormwater management plan that they could use to develop their local programs. And, uh, the way the rule was set up is that the local governments would set their would submit their local programs in two cohorts. There was the set of the original rural communities and then the newly added ones, and they were six months apart. All of the local programs require EMC approval prior to local adoption and implementation. And today we're requesting uh, approval to take it to the EMC, the first set of those. I want to review real quick the improvements that we had in the 2020 revision of the rules. Um, what we did is we made the structure and the requirements more or less the same in the news and the TARPAM. They have differences in their targets and their nutrient targets based on uh, what the original uh, requirements were. Um, we've codified and clarified several of the requirements from the earlier model programs, the earlier news and TARPAM rules were really pretty vague in terms of what they required 
And so some of the things that were developed as part of the model program from back then was brought into the new rule. Uh, so both of them now have similar stormwater rules in terms of uh, their high, low and high density requirements, and they mirror the stormwater rules themselves, the, the ones over in O2H, so that uh, a lot of them are also uh, MS4 communities so that they would be able to have very consistent stormwater implementation across multiple programs. Uh, they can use nutrient offsets uh, to meet their nutrient thresholds on development sites that are not otherwise met by on-site stormwater treatment. Uh, we have a revised phosphorus target for the tar pamlico. We addressed incremental BUA additions. Uh, we have a new nutrient calculation tool, which happens to be the same one in use in the Falls and Jordan watersheds. And we dropped peak flow regulation and the stormwater retrofit identification as it turned out it wasn't really helping us very much. So I wanna cover, as part of the model program development, we were considering what the local governments actually needed and, and, and it really was dependent on what their various characteristics were. Um, the original rural communities were already starting with a local program and uh, local ordinance of some sort. Whereas the new rural communities were starting from scratch in a lot of cases, not all of them. Some of them are MS4, but some of them uh, are, don't have any sort of storm, stormwater program or they're working uh, with another local government to implement. Uh, some of them have one, two, or even three watersheds per jurisdiction and overlaps, especially with falls. They may have uh, county or uh, coastal stormwater requirements going on in their jurisdiction that they may not be implementing, but are applicable to developers. So it complicates this situation. Uh, they may have ORW, HQW, and uh, they may have water supply watershed. Several of them are NPS stormwater phase ones and phase twos. We have counties and cities that have completely very different processes and issues in terms of how development happens in their jurisdiction, and generally a large range of experience and readiness. And as we discovered during the process uh, over the past couple of years, there has been a lot of staff turnover in many of these jurisdictions. Some cases we have totally new staff and they, uh, they had to catch up with what was happening in their jurisdiction. So real briefly, the model program that we brought to you last year had a local program development guide. It had a model stormwater ordinance for new development that was based on the uh, 2011 falls model ordinance that was developed in turn previously by Richard Wins Wisnett of the UNC School of Government. And then we developed a model stormwater management template uh, working with the NPDES MS4 program so that we could have a very similar stormwater template to what they use. Uh, in fact, to allow those that are already MS4s to be able to just use the exact same document or even merge the programs in terms of implementation. Uh, we provide a lot of guidance through the whole process. We had lots of MS teams and uh, meetings and calls, a lot of individual um, calls to work through what kinds of issues they had. So just to cover what the, we were expecting them or what, what their local programs were supposed to be covering, the ordin or what kind of what we were looking at, needs to detail how their post-construction stormwater control, their illicit discharge and public education programs are to be carried out. We wanna see specifically how they're doing it. And there are some details within that that we asked for specifically to understand how they're doing things. Uh, it would, we would expect their local program to describe how they're evaluating their own progress in implementing their uh, program. So the way it was set up using the, uh, the MS4 like stormwater management plan, they would, it would be set up as metrics, ways that they would measure their own progress and metrics so that it could be fairly simple in order for them to actually record and keep track of what they were doing. And so it'd be easier for them to submit as part of their annual report. Their local program would also provide local details that help us understand 
the context of how they implement rules, how the since this is usually integrated into their local zoning re regulation, we need to understand how this works in terms of their development review process. And uh, then they might have a new or revised stormwater ordinance that they're submitting to us. So what we looked for, um, what I was looking for in, in general was I had a set of things that I wanted to see that they were covering in terms of their overall program and how it was organized in terms of uh, public education activities of how they were going to be doing that. Do they have some specifics in which they could actually be tracking uh, their illicit discharge program, which I had uh, ex expectations even for counties, even while they do not have a municipal separate storm sewer system, they still have natural streams and they definitely will still have illicit discharge problems with those streams. So we talked a lot about what even a minimal county level sort of illicit discharge program might look like. I asked them to give me the, the stormwater context of and how it fits into their larger plan review process uh, and what kinds of triggers they might have. Um, I asked them for the specific list of actions they'd be intending to take to implement the rule. That's what uh, the overall rule is looking for is how are you implementing your program? And so I wanted them to be specific and, and what this does is for those programs that are less experienced and there's a wide variety of experience, even in the local governments that are already implementing the rules in how well or how organized they are in terms of the current implementation. So the process of developing these local programs really made them have to think about what do they need to do? When do they need to do it? What kind of resources do they need in order to implement that? What kind of schedule? Uh, this applies to things like public education, where many of them are working with Clean Water Education Partnership. And so I asked them specifically, what are you doing with clean water? What are you, what are you asking them to do for you? Can you share with me a, a draft agreement with them? And how are they reporting back to you what they have done for you? Because that's part of the annual reporting is to tell us what they're doing. Uh, we asked them to document various community specific situations and com their compliance approach. Oftentimes this was really based on the difference between how cities and counties work. We asked for a draft stormwater ordinance and lots of supporting materials. Sometimes I would ask them, do you have an illicit discharge ordinance already? Uh, do you have a public education plan already? Um, just to get a better understanding of how they were doing things. But what I am sharing with you right now is having reviewed all of these supporting materials is uh, what I consider a completed and satisfactory local program. And as I know, there is a whole bunch of variation in terms of their skills and abilities and complexity. But the goal was to try to get them all up to being of a minimal amount of, of achievement where I thought that they would be able to get this implemented. Some of them are very, very simplistic, but I think they're going to be completely adequate to getting the job done. Some of them are very, very complex indeed. And they're usually from the, the cities that have been doing this sort of thing for several years already. So we have uh, this is this list of the draft programs that we're pre presenting in this set. As I said, we have broken up the first cohort into two groups. Uh, the first set is 12 and the second set is 11. And just to cover their characteristics, nine of them are noose and four of those are Falls Lake, three are Tar Pamlico. 10 of them use the MS style local program template. Uh, although only two of those have actually merged their nutrient management strategy program with their MS4 program. So some of them like the structure, even though they are uh, MS4 program, but they might, some of them uh, requested to be able to keep them separate for the time being, but they always have the option uh, in the future if they want to combine their MS4 and nutrient management strategy reporting uh, if they overlap, uh, that's le uh, significantly less work for them, and it's a much more structured document for us to look at. Two of them use the model ordinance completely. They just 
proposed to readopt a whole new stormwater ordinance and others they use significant borrowing you could tell from the language that was used that they they took out large chunks to use for their ordinance um, there is one in the set i think that is coastal management area and that i think is washington uh, and all of them have previous stormwater programs since they're already implementing either the noose or the tar pamlico rules So to review a quick kind of what what is happening here. So we're going to bring them in three sets. Uh, this is a proposed schedule. It may not be exactly like that, um, but what we would do is after your approval to bring this to the EMC, then we bring this first set to the EMC for their approval, and then they have six months to start to adopt their local program, to adopt their local ordinance, and start implementation. But what that means a little bit more precisely. So what they understand is that they're presenting to you a draft that may change somewhat. Uh, they have had changes in staff. They've had some changes in organization. Uh, several of them have long, complicated processes for citizen review of ordinances, and they do very much expect that some small parts of them might be tweaked and changed. And that's some expectation, but the understanding is that what they will adopt is going to be substantially the same as what you are approving. And if they have any changes, we want them letting us know as soon as possible what those changes are so that we can work with them, discuss whether we think those are significant differences. So our requested action is that you uh, uh, you approve uh, for us to proceed to the EMC with the first 12 of the news and the Tar Pamlico local programs for implementation of new development stormwater. Thank you. Are there any questions? Mr. McAdams. Uh, um, Ms. Diarconti, um, I remember clearly the, the model ordinance that you presented to us that was especially well done. So now the, the actual proposed ordinances are coming back to us. Um, I'm just curious, as these get presented to you and to your staff, uh, what amount of back and forth might there be? Do you, um, do you engage in that? Do you find things that you think are not up to the, the needs? Well, there's only one of them that I didn't ask for anything different. One of them came in, had everything I was looking for, and I could find it. Most of them, I had a document that I used to help me review to look for all the pieces, look for all of the elements of the ordinance to try to make sure they were somewhere, because they're not all using a similar structure in terms of ordinance. They've got these elements in different locations. Uh, some of them have the requirements in their local program and their ordinance, points to the local program. Some of them have the large amounts of requirements in the ordinance. So there was at least one major review where I looked for everything and anything I couldn't find, anything I was looking for, I had a, a summary of, can you tell me where this is? Can you tell me about what you're doing for this? I'm looking for more specifics on this element of your program. And so their, their second version that they sent into me is what is presented in here. And with several of them, I actually had long uh, MS Teams calls even before they submitted mm -hmm. anything. In fact, most of them I had a long, long conversation about what I was looking for and expectations and how to do this. And have these uh, 12 draft ordinances passed your own approval? Are you, are you satisfied with them? I think they're going to work just fine. And are they in a draft form? Are, are, are the jurisdictions awaiting EMC's approval before they adopt them? That is correct. They okay. wait for EMC approval and then they start the process for their local adoption, which can involve several boards, review and things like that. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioner Davis. Um, have there been any concerns or requests for delays or changes related to the ARPA funding that will be provided for stormwater? Do you foresee any, any major changes or is this funding just hopefully going to be able to help offset the cost of what's already been planned? Uh, so none of them asked for that. 
And from what I understand of the funding, it is very much related to addressing some of their uh, existing stormwater infrastructure needs. So none of the new SARTARPAM rule requirements really require them to ad address any existing infrastructure problems. Now, some of them do and, and have gone through our 319 program or our 205J program already to acquire grants for stormwater mapping, for stormwater retrofits. So it's possible that some of them may be already looking for these funds, but it doesn't really intersect because these rules are about uh, regulating new development instead of managing their existing infrastructure. Thank you. I'll just comment briefly. Um, there was one, I think you suggested that I direct the question to <laughs> Mr. Johnson, Shelton Johnson. But this is uh, really beyond the, the scope of what we're addressing today. It's a larger issue, I think, and it was in the model. Um, we are advising them or requiring them to inspect a um, project of stream buffer, uh, stream buffer related projects, inspect it after completion of construction. In my opinion, inspection needs to occur during construction in addition to after completion, because if you wait until after completion, the damage is already done, and then it takes time to correct that, if at all. And we've already experienced that in the past year or two with one or two projects, not in this mm -hmm. context, but in another. So um, that remains a concern of mine to make sure that these local programs are out in the field inspecting during projects, not after the projects are completed. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other aspect of this is that because of resources, we have to rely heavily on the local program self-auditing and self-evaluating and reporting any adjustments that they find as a result of uh, their evaluations and needing to make improvements. Um, I continue to stress the importance of monitoring that. If we ever have adequate funding to, to do periodic audits of these local programs, yeah, I think it would go a long way in educating the local programs as well as making folks at the state level more comfortable that the programs are being implemented appropriately. So, One thing that some of the local governments asked me, while the uh, annual report format is actually really highly structured and is composed of like numbers and lists and things like that, some of them did ask whether it would be okay to um, to have a descriptive, very descriptive part of their annual report where they explain maybe what happened over the past year and what kind of uh, difficulties they may have encountered. And uh, definitely through the process of developing the model program, we talked a lot about how, what kind of challenges they had had with implementing the past rules. and. Uh, how that affected them and, and what kind of problems they uh, encountered. And so I did ask them, I said, if you feel comfortable, share with us where you thought that you were going to implement things in a certain way and it's not working because it helps us understand uh, how the rules work and makes us you know, consider how, whether we need to do things differently for another watershed. Thank you. Commissioner Harris, were you about to ask a question? I just asked a question. Question. Okay. Um, thank you for all that information. Uh, I tried to get through it, so I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. It was a little tough at times. Um, the track changes that I saw in some of them, that is from the local government. That was the way it was presented with the track changes. Um, I didn't like it at first, but then it was helpful for me to see where the changes were, not knowing what the previous one looked like. So um, I did see some comments in there was that staff comments and I okay so that was not us because someone um, had comments and one of them like where's your stormwater manual do you have it posted for the public and that kind of thing those were helpful but obviously it must have been in their review 
That's it what it, it looked like to me. I we didn't return. We didn't do any sort of edits or comments within what they sent us. Instead, I sent them a separate document that kind of laid everything out. So, uh, in those documents where they have comments and things like that, I think it reflects their own internal review. Okay, but you would be do we will we will be approving. I wouldn't say in concept, but there's still some more work that has to be done. So, if that was something of a concern for state staff. That would be put in and you would ask for that reference and I noticed some of them are reference referencing other states. Is that common practice? Uh, there was 1 that was going to uh, Virginia uh, for their stormwater management model ordinance. I thought that was kind of interesting uh, and also Metro North Georgia. So I didn't know. And again, I, I, I don't have that in my brain to know where those uh, references uh, took place, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I think that's it. I think I understand what I read. I did see some old terminology. I assume your templates like best management practices. Yes. Uh, there was one that had a, a basic four page ordinance and you're saying yes, that's going to be. So that was one of the ones where when we checked, we checked with our lawyers, we checked with their lawyers, how they felt whether they could implement this. So this, that was 1, which I remember very clearly. They have all their almost all their requirements in their, their local program and their ordinance. I may, I told them, make sure. The important part here is your ordinance points directly to this other document and says that the requirements in that local program have to be met. And that's specific in the ordinance. But when we discussed this with both of our lawyers, we came to the conclusion that this would be workable and that local government has been working with that ordinance and local program structure already for the past 15 years, 20 years. Uh, and it has evidently not encountered any challenges with that structure. Yeah, because I, I read the four, and I didn't go down the list. I moved around just yeah. for a uh, variety. I started with small ones, to be honest with you. Um, and I noticed the next one I read, it was 33 pages. So I thought, okay, um, can we put requirements down in four pages? But it obviously that you can. So um, while this was a little painful, I'll be honest, it was a good exercise for me uh, to see these. And it just kind of reminds us or reminded me of my responsibilities on this commission. So that's all. I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Harris. Anyone else? I think if the committee members are agreeable, we could accept a motion of the collection of plans as opposed to going through each and every one. Any objection to doing that? Okay. Okay. Then I will entertain a motion to approve this list of plans to be carried to the full EMC for review and approval. Commissioner Harris makes the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Davis. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We are running a little bit behind, um, more than a little bit, but I alerted Commissioner Arata for the Air Quality Committee. Uh, hopefully it won't be too much of an impact on their schedule. Our next item is, I believe, a presentation from Mr. Ventilara. Is that correct? Yes, estimated timeline for development of a statewide recreational standard for Escherichia coli, E. coli, in primary recreation class B waters. Chris Ventilaro, Division of Water Resources, Classification Standards and Rules Review Branch. This is an information item. Uh, it's a follow up to a, a, a directive that we gave at our last commission meeting. And for the remaining two presenters, anything you can do to condense Let's your start. presentation would be greatly appreciated. Oh. 
Sorry. We have um, we have 40 minutes left in the regular schedule. Uh, we do need to allow about five minutes at the end for commission business, committee business. So that means about 35 minutes if we could fit it in. But if we run a little bit over, hopefully the air quality committee will understand. Sorry, we just have a hard time getting to the present too. Okay. I apologize. I just wouldn't have heard it. I was on my way anyway. Are we ready? Okay. We're good. All right. Welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so, again, my name is Chris Ventiloro, and I'm a water quality standards coordinator with the Division of Water Resources. Um, and I understand that we might be a little bit short on time, so I'll go through this a little bit quickly. But if anyone has any questions after, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my contact information is at the end of the presentation. So, this, uh, this morning, I'm just going to give a quick review of a work plan. An estimated timeline for the development of a statewide recreational standard for E. coli primary recreation class B waters. Uh, so, as you all may remember, uh, as part of this surface water triennial review, the department proposed the adoption of a site specific standard for E. coli in the Asheville region of North Carolina. Um, and during the rulemaking process, we heard back from EPA. Um, and we about that they would not really be supportive of a site specific E. coli standard. Um, and we also received a lot of public comments indicating a strong desire for statewide E. coli standards in class B waters. So taking that information into consideration, when the when we came back to the EMC in March of 2022 with the surface water standards and the hearing officers report, uh, the hearing officers report included a recommendation to not adopt the site specific standard as proposed. And the EMC agreed to that and instead directed the department to create a work plan for the development of a statewide recreation standard and to present that work plan uh, in May of 2022, which brings us to today. So, since that time, the department's been working on this work plan um, and this work plan does have a few different stages. It has a development stage. A statewide bacteria study stage, as well as a rulemaking stage. Um, and I won't go through all of the bullets here, but I'll just touch on the main topics of each stage. For the development stage, um, there's actually a lot of different things going on in this part of the of this the plan here. Uh, for one, we'll be 
developing the statewide fecal coliform E. coli monitoring study plan. Uh, we'll also be working to um, engage contractors to help us perform monitoring analysis and going through state budgeting. Uh, this, this stage also includes actual development of the standard, the rule language that will come before the committee and the commission. Uh, and of course, this will also include some stakeholder outreach to kind of discuss the bacteria standard um, and hopefully educate and have a discussion on the differences between the standards, uh, how water body classifications work, implementation of the standards, as well as how um, the Department of Health and Human Services swimming, swimming advisories kind of play into this. The second stage of the work plan is the actual bacteria study and data analysis stage. So basically we're, we're doing a bacteria study where we'll be comparing fecal coliform levels and E. coli levels um, from class B waters around the state. Um, and this is really being done to better understand the relationship between these two bacteria indicators um, with the hope that as we understand this relationship better, we'll be able to better inform stakeholders of potential benefits and impacts and also inform um, the implementation of the standard in water protection programs, such as the NPDES permitting program and monitoring and assessment. Uh, the bacteria study stage also incorporates a period for data review um, and the determination of the statistical relationship between those two bacteria indicators. Um, and it also incorporates um, an implementation assessment period where the NPDES section will assess impacts to permitted facilities and the department's modeling and assessment branch will assess impacts to the assessment of class B waters, which plays into determination of water body impairments as well as uh, TMDLs. And then lastly, this assessment, this implementation assessment will help to inform the regulatory impact analysis that will be done as part of the rulemaking for the adoption of the class B E. coli standards. And then lastly, of course, we have the rulemaking stage. Um, and this is just the typical triennial review uh, rulemaking stage, since this will be an E. coli standard for statewide waters, uh, class B waters. We'll have to make sure that we satisfy the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act, as well as the Clean Water Act. So this actually brings us to the timeline that we developed for this work plan. Um, and I do have a few notes I wanna make sure I touch on. So this slide is actually focused on the bacteria study and the rulemaking timeline, um, since those are the two components that really have kind of set timeframes. Uh, and this, you know, for the most part, this study and the evaluation of the data and the rulemaking require more, more of a linear process where kind of each stage for the most part is informing the stage after it. So it, you, you'll kind of see it spread as a linear um, kind of framework there, but there, there will be some overlap in these stages. So some things will be going on concurrently. So the plan here is to leverage existing work agreements that the department has with universities um, to use their resources to conduct the majority of the sampling and the transportation of the E. coli and fecal sampling to the um, certified laboratories that will actually conduct the analysis of the samples. And the reason why this is being done is because with um, this, the many class B waters spread throughout the state, the state itself doesn't have the resources to do this intensive monitor. So we're really hoping to, to get these relationships with universities and have them be able to go out and do the sampling. And, and that, that will really serve to really truncate this whole process um, to make this process a little bit more, uh, a little bit more um, kind of expeditious and, and go a little bit more quickly and smoothly. Uh, you can see up on stage one in the top left, we're actually um, engaged right now in developing the study plan and also the scoping documents for the bacteria study. Um, and we're also in the process of kind of engaging with those universities to build those relationships, which will help us go through the contracting processes more quickly. And this should all take place starting this month in May and going through about mid-July, we're hoping, of this year. Uh, once we get those contracts in place and we have everything set up, we'll be able to move on to the actual um, bacteria monitoring plan, which, you know, basically this, the, 
the study period of the monitoring plan will cover an entire swimming season. But if you look at that um, leftmost box in stage two, you'll see that it's actually split across two different years. And the reason why we've done this is that we really want to try and expedite this process. You know, per the EMC uh, concerns and the concerns of the general public, you know, there's been, uh, you know, kind of indicated to us that we, we really want to try and move this, you know, as quickly as we can reasonably do it uh, while still producing good usable information. So the first part of this bacteria study will occur uh, hopefully beginning around mid July of 2022 and stretching through October of 2022. And then the second stage of this will begin in April of 2023 and stretching through June of 2023. Um, and the reason why we have this split with those months is because this is really how we define the swimming season in North Carolina. It's defined as April through October. And we really want to focus on those months because that's, you know, this is a recreational standard that's being developed and that this is really the period where the greatest exposure that will, uh, people will have to bacteria in these surface waters. So once the actual studies are done, um, we'll be moving on to that second box in stage two where we start to do a quality assurance, quality control review of the data that's been collected and also an analysis of the data and that implementation evaluation. Um, and this is an important step This should probably take a few months to do, but this will help us to inform the next step, the rulemaking stage three. Uh, so that implementation evaluation and the determination of that relationship between the fecal coliform and the E. coli levels in the surface waters will help to inform the development of the regulatory impact analysis. Um, so that information will be directly used to figure out costs and benefits um, for the potential development of this E. coli standard as we move forward. Uh, that should begin around October of 2023 um, and around, you know, that, that same time towards the end of the year in 2023, beginning of 2024, we'll be beginning the formal rulemaking process for the proposed E. coli standard in Class B waters. Um, so I provided, if you see that light green box, we provided kind of an estimate of when we expect, you know, the various stages of the triennial review rulemaking, when we expect to kind of see those carried out. Um, if everything goes well, we would get to the Water Quality Committee in January 2024, and then to EMC in March. And then following that, we would go to public notice either in April or May, depending on, you know, basically when we can get the material submitted and, and the okay to post to the uh, North Carolina Register. Uh, once we're posted to the register, we do have to abide by the Clean Water Act requirement that we allow for 45 days in between the posting of the notice and the holding of the first public hearing. Um, so then we expect to do the first public hearing at least in June. And since this is a statewide process, we may do multiple hearings. Um, and then we do like to allow for, you know, at least a few weeks after the last public hearing to for folks to have it a few a few additional weeks to submit public comments. Um, so that would get us returning to the EMC in November with the hearing officer's report and the recommendation uh, to adopt the E. coli standard for statewide waters. Um, and if all of that goes well, we've got approval from the EMC. In November, we'd be able to get to the Rules Review Commission for rulemaking in December of 2024. Um, and then lastly, before I get to any questions, I do want to touch on some of the work that the Asheville region has been doing over the past few years. Uh, so the Asheville region has been conducting a recreational monitoring program. Uh, they've been working to monitor E. coli and fecal coliforms in, in segments of the French Broad River. Um, and they've had some interesting findings to date. They've found that E. coli and fecal coliforms, at least in that water body, are highly correlated. Uh, they, they correlate very well to one another. So if you have high E. coli levels, you expect to see high fecal levels. Um, those E. coli and fecal coliform levels also correlate well with turbidity, where if you have high turbidity, you expect to see high fecal or E. coli levels. Um, and a few other things that they've noticed is that the, the fecal levels, at least, frequently exceed the Class B standard in the French Broad River, and that they do anticipate some apparent listings in that section of the French Broad. And this is all important because we do plan to use that data in our analysis. So we're hoping to really 
kind of leverage what they've done and save us a bunch of work, hopefully, to, to be able to incorporate that into the plan that we're doing now. Um, and Asheville is continuing to work on this, this recreational monitoring. Um, they're doing some estimative models and, and looking into potentially expanding their monitoring program and also engaging stakeholders. Um, so we, we plan to be working closely with the Asheville Regional Office as we go through this process. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. Tried to cover it quickly to save save some time, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions from commission members? Yes, Commissioner Harris. I, I just want to say thank you. I know this was tough. I know your plate is full. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the department in particular to help move this forward. Uh, I have been getting some correspondence and there are a lot of folks tracking this and very appreciative of this effort. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I have, oh yes, Chairman, Chairman Smith or, <laughs> and then Commissioner Vaughn is after that. Thanks. Uh, so one question about the um, bacteria study. Can you just say a little bit more about what the purpose of the study is? Yeah, absolutely. So the goals of the study are really to provide stakeholders an idea of the potential benefits and impacts. So basically we want to look and we want to see, you know, if we're looking the current standard for class B waters is for fecal coliforms. So we know what to kind of expect if we're out there monitoring for fecal coliforms. How is that going to change if we switch that standard to E. coli and what should stakeholders expect? By doing the study, by going out and um, performing the monitoring over the swimming season months, we're hoping to see if there's a relationship between the fecal coliform and E. coli indicators so we could provide kind of at least an estimate to folks to say, you know, if we see high fecal coliform levels, then we expect to see high E. coli levels. Um, and that kind of will give people an idea of, you know, whether they may be impacted or not. And this, this will also play into how that might impact um, permanent facilities um, as, you know, they'll be able to see, well, you know, we're able to meet our current fecal. What's going to happen if this standard changes? How will this new E. coli standard value compare to what we're doing now? So is that clear? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So, so basically you're looking at the correlation between the two different standards. Correct. Yep. Commissioner Monis. And I'm sorry if you already said this, but when's the next triennial review cycle? So we're, we're still finishing up the current one, but we're hoping to start in 2023. Okay. So, so how much quicker is this than that? Like a, uh, it, it's hard to say it, it kind of, you know, the big thing about this. Action is that we're really, you know, we're, we're really focused on doing that bacteria study. So it, it kind of, you know, it may end up kind of falling in line. With the next training review cycle, or it may end up going a little bit quicker. It, we're hoping that, you know, it'll be, it might move along a little bit more quickly. Um, but. You know, that, that'll kind of come in time. I think if we go look at the timeline, um, you know, we really start getting into the, the development stage of the next triennial review, hopefully around the beginning of 2023. Um, and by the development stage, that usually takes us about a good year. So we wouldn't really get back to rulemaking until about 2024, mid 2024 anyway, with the triennial. So there, there is potentially going to be some overlap here, but we're really trying to kind of expedite this as much as we can. Um, and while, you know, being able to address the concerns that, that have been brought to our attention. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. So, yeah. So I just had 1 or 2 questions sure. about timeline as well. Um, can you stress the importance the, of the April to June 23 exercise and why July through October isn't adequate? Right, so we want to capture we want to capture a full swimming season. So basically, we want to capture all of these different climate changes. Yeah. You know, we have information from the one river in Asheville, which is good, but we want to see if that correlation holds up across the state. Um, we want to see if it holds up throughout the entire swimming season. Um, right. So, is there anything that can be done during that five month waiting period for the next round of bacterial review? Bacteria study, yeah, that the during department that, can be doing to help accelerate the schedule. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. So during that period, we'll be looking. So that first first part of that study that we're going from July to October, well, we should be having that data come in. You know, as we get that data, it will be able to start QA, Q, QC reviewing it, kind of organizing it, look at potential, you know, basically evaluating what we see at that point. During that stage, it'll also give us an opportunity to evaluate um, any kind of issues that we came across during that first stage of sampling so that we could address them in the second stage. Um, and, you know, depending on the information that we see, we may want to reconsider what we look at in the second stage. We may want to focus on specific um, sampling stations that we saw high levels at, or we may want to kind of balance things out. So, in general, it will just be kind of a, a stage for us to kind of review what's happened and see if there's a way for us to basically improve on what we're doing while giving a preliminary look at the data that we're getting so far. Right, right. And while all of that's going on, we'll also be working on developing the actual standard, which, you know, incorporates reviewing the EPA criteria, put together the rulemaking language and all that. So you could potentially build some efficiency into that and reduce the amount of time for the July to September 23 QAQC review. Potential, right? yeah. Save a little time there. Exactly. The other thing that I would stress, and I'm sure you're going to ask this of whoever you contract to do this study, is that they have a very um, well laid out quality assurance project plan. And if that is implemented, if it is designed and implemented well, it should reduce the amount of work you have to do considerably. So I, I'm questioning whether three months for QAQC, I know there's more than just QAQC in that three months, but I think that that can be done efficiently if they give you the, the best QAPP plan they can. Yep, so. and, and that is a priority for us is to make sure that the folks that we end up having sample for us are, you know, kind of in line with what the department does. So we'll have some oversight over that as well. All right. And as Vice Chair Harris said, thank you so much for turning this around and getting it back to us at our um, meeting this month. We appreciate it and wish you well with the study. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. Uh, our final information item is North Carolina Water Quality Assessment and 303D list update and prioritizing waters for restoration by Cam McNutt, Division Water Resources Modeling Branch. Mr. McNutt, I'm sorry being at the end of the day, we are running over. Um, and I think you, we had allowed you probably 40 minutes or more for this. Can we manage a little shorter? I will, I will cut out one part of it. I can send you a link to some videos that we've done. Okay. And I have a lot of, I'm developing a lot of other presentations all out of the states as well. If you want me to. But I'll, I'll move pretty quickly, but if you have a question, just. Uh, Thank you. Thanks very much. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the uh, results of the 2022 water quality assessment, uh, the public comments, and the timeline for the 2024 integrated report development. And I'll briefly touch on how we're prioritizing these impaired waters for development and restoration plans. And I will skip the demonstration of the story map. Now we can give you one later on. So uh, this is what I was just talking about. I will point out that one of the reasons that we really wanted to get our 303D list in on time this year is because this is the 50th uh, anniversary of the Clean Water Act. So we wanted to get ours in on time. We did get it in on time, and EPA did approve our list within the 30-day time frame. And I haven't checked around the country with my counterparts, but that may be the first time that that's ever happened. So hopefully, hopefully everyone else is getting theirs in as well. Uh, you, a lot of you have seen this before. This is our integrated report framework. Uh, basically, what this is showing are when water bodies and parameters that are meeting criteria, it means things are good, exceeding criteria, that's the red, and then we have a data inconclusive category as well. Once we do that, then we put these into Clean Water Act guidance categories one, two, three, four, and five. 
Category one assessments would be, for instance, like dissolved oxygen is meeting criteria in a particular creek. And category five assessments would be an example of turbidity exceeding criteria. And that is a water body that is considered impaired. Now, a sub part of the impaired waters is the 303D list, and that is the component that EPA does approve. The category four waters, category four assessments are also exceeding criteria, but we have some sort of a management strategy in place, TMDL, as such like that, and that requires EPA approval to remove that assessment from the 303D list. Here's a couple different ways to look at the results of the 2022 assessment. The pie chart that's on the left there, that 15,330 assessments, those are the individual ones like for dissolved oxygen, turbidity, uh, benthic community, et cetera. And you can have multiple assessments per water body. The pie chart on the left are the water bodies of the state. So the pie chart that's on the left with the assessments all fits into that basically 25% of the waters of the state. Most of the waters in the state are not monitored, so we do not do assessments on those. Uh, as you can see, most of our assessments, 11,000 plus, are meeting criteria. Those are category one assessments. And then the, the little piece of red pie up there, 1,409 assessments, that is the 303D list. And those 1,409 assessments fit into 1,214 individual water bodies. So many water bodies have more than one 303D uh, listed parameter. I think we have one water body that has five. So that would probably be our most uh, impaired water body as far as as many, the amount of parameters that are impaired in that water body. I call these water bodies, but our technical term that we use is assessment units, our AUs. You might see that littered through here as well. Here's the graphic showing changes from the 2020 assessment. And the arrows indicate uh, how many assessments are moving from uh, meeting criteria to data inconclusive or the other way from exceeding criteria. The, what, the assessments that are moving into the gray area pretty much comes as data noise. You see 199 of them going from meeting criteria to exceeding criteria. A lot of that is things like turbidity. That's very noisy and part of a rainfall issue potentially. And we may see uh, 80 of those go back into meeting criteria next time. The ones that we really want to take a closer look at are there's 32 that went from meeting criteria to exceeding criteria. And those are ones where we had previous monitoring. The ones that went from data inconclusive into exceeding criteria, the 21 on that yellow area, a lot of those are the result of new sampling stations. So we did not have data before and now we do. And as uh, Chris was pointing out, Asheville Regional Office had several of those new ones that they've expanded their monitoring out there. And now that the 303D list is approved, that portion of the French Broad River is now uh, officially impaired for uh, recreational water quality fecal coliform bacteria. Here's a summary of just the 303D list. That's those 1,409 assessments by parameter. Uh, our, mo our most persistent and longest term listings are those 304 and 97 for ecological integrity, benthic, and fish community. We also have increased our fecal coliform listings for recreation by about eight this time. And you can see the biggest part of our 303D list, almost half of it, are 600 water bodies that are impaired because they are not approved for shellfish harvesting. Moving on to the comments that we received. Uh, we received comments from nine different organizations. Uh, each of the organizations had several different types of comments. I'll summarize those in a second. Uh, during 2020, which was uh, height of COVID, uh, we only received comments from six. Their six are still on there, and then we added a few new commentors. In general, the comments, a lot of them were repeated comments that we've addressed in previous times. We have to respond to EPA when we, in our submittal package to comments regarding the 303D list itself. A lot of those were water body specific, and we worked with the commenters to make sure that we were able to address those, and we'll continue to work with the commenters and other interested parties to clarify any of the assessments that we have anywhere in the integrated report, not just the 303D list. We do take comments on the integrated report, and we often get comments that are outside of the scope of the integrated report, and we will pass those on to appropriate DWR staff, like the uh, comments on the trout water uh, temperature assessment. 
The comments that we received regarding the listing and delisting methodology, the assessment unit assignment, and the use of statistical confidence, we have addressed those in at least one, two, or three other cycles before. So we reference back to the, uh, the responses that we made on those. The only uh, real new uh, comment we have was on our data tiering, which we have actually been using since the 2000s, but as the commission had requested us to do is to make the data submittal process uh, a lot more transparent and easier for outside entities to collect and submit quality data that we can use in the assessment process. So we just basically highlighted those tiers this time. It caused a little bit of confusion, but I think we've worked it out with all of the interested parties and we're gonna work on our website and our data submittal process to uh, make that a little smoother as well. We generally uh, do not get a lot of data submittals, but that is increasing and we're expecting to uh, receive data for 2024 from uh, not just uh, Charlotte and from some university staff, but also uh, from the river keepers have set up their, an approved QAPP and we expect them to be submitting data as well coming up. So our work plan for 2024, um, I, I was at, when I put this presentation together, I was fully expecting EPA to approve our 303D portion in May, June at the earliest. That's been approved, so there's one thing down. The official uh, approval happens when we upload our data into the EPA tracking system, and we expect to get that done in the next couple of weeks. And then our next step is to get reapproval of the 2024 listing and delisting methods. That is an EMC Water Quality Committee uh, activity. Um, we have, we're not anticipating making any changes to that from 2022. So that may be a pretty simple process. We'll present uh, the, the somewhat confusing methodology and uh, go through that again, just to make sure that uh, EMC is clear on what it is our methodology is. EPA does not approve that, but they approve the results of it. So it's important for us to get that step done. And then we'll go through our other parts, including coordination of third party data submittal, um, and then hopefully again, submitting to EPA the 303D portion in April, April 1st, 2024. So shifting gears, we have these 1,214 water bodies that have at least one 303D listed parameter. You can see them on the map there. there a lot of them are, you see the big red blurs, those are concentrated generally around some urban areas. And then the lots of red lines in the coastal area as well, representing uh, shellfish waters that are not approved. So in, in our guidance, we're supposed to be addressing these with a TMDL or a management strategy within eight to 13 years of listing. So part of our next step in prioritization process, besides listing them, is to go find those older ones and try to bring them up to date or get new data. And then we will be making, in, in kind of a new process, we'll be making commitments to EPA on how many of these water bodies we'll be working on each two year period. And we'll be developing a candidate list that goes out for a 10 year period. So basically we'll be starting that this year and going through 2032. So we'll have developed a list of candidate water bodies and then we will uh, be working on developing, putting those into the schedule in two year increments. Now we have previously done this. Um, we, we committed to doing 59 impaired 303D listed water body plans, restoration plans in 2015. We've completed 30 of those and these are, these are separate 59 separate plans because a lot of them are grouped water bodies. So it's gonna be more like 20 to 25 plans that cover multiple assessment units. Uh, seven of these that are in progress, we may have to carry over due to some technical concerns, especially regarding uh, development of a TMDL. Six of the plans were TMDLs and the others were alternatives, which I'm putting that in quotes because we're gonna not really use that word very much, but originally in, in the EPA groups, the alternative was an alternative to a TMDL. And now we've widened that out to include uh, less regulatory restoration plans and also protection plans. Putting this back into the integrated reporting framework, we have the category four subcategories. Category four T is a TMDL, B is a management strategy. And to take those off of the 303D list requires an EPA approval. So there has to be some sort of assurance that we'll be meeting water quality standards with those plans. So those fall into a more of a regulatory area where they'll be required to implement. 
The category 4R is used mostly in planning areas where we find problems that are already related to a 303D listed stream, but we don't really need to put it onto the 303D list because it's already under an implementation strategy. And category 5R is the newer one that where we are putting together non-regulatory management strategy called watershed action plans. And uh, this is where we'll house all of this information so that it's very accessible. Oh, let's see if I can just flip to that. Yeah. So this is an online based plan instead of a, a large three ring binder type of thing. And the, the main part here to emphasize is we want to get watershed improvement projects, 319 projects going as soon as possible, instead of waiting for a four or five year process to make an exhaustive list of all the potential problems. When we know we already have problems, find them, identify them, prioritize them quickly, and then go after funding to implement those projects and then cycle that through the geography of the plan. Uh, a big difference between these plans and say like a Noose River estuary restoration strategy and rules is that these are much smaller scale and they're very much locally driven. We are not going out and starting these on our own. We actually have people lining up for us to start implement or putting these plans together with their help. So we're providing the tech and the guidance and the capabilities in that area, but the local, the local groups are the ones that are actually putting the plans together and deciding on what kind of uh, improvement projects they want to make. So in this terminology, a watershed improvement project does not necessarily have to be related to water. It can be related to improving the watershed as a whole. So that gives people a lot more flexibility to come at this from a couple of different directions. And we have set it up so that you can get to this process by like a step-by-step K-12 type of way, or you can come through it with the TMDL page so you have professionals intersecting with local interested citizens, local governments, uh, all in the same area and documentation. Uh, because there's not a lot of printed material in these, we can change it all the time and be very adaptive in what we're doing. So prioritization, we did solicit during our 303D comments. We asked for candidates. We did not receive any formal candidates, but as I said earlier, we have a lot of people that are lining up for us to develop these watershed action plans for of the various flavors it may include TMDLs, more formalized management strategies, as well as the uh, inform or the uh, non regulatory ones. And we're prioritizing a little bit differently than we did in 2015, which it was all new to us. We went through a large and I would say somewhat painful GIS exercise with DWR staff to make a list. And now what we're doing is having people come to us that have local. Uh, resources, opportunities, capacity, and we're leveraging that to get things done as quickly as possible. And the commitments we will be updating as part of our integrated report schedule. So every two years, we'll have a new set of five or six assessment units that are 303 to this. Where we're going to be working on uh, a watershed action plan to restore those waters. And this is where I would go into a live demonstration, but this is what they look like, and I will get you the link. It's very interactive. People can in, go on their phones, get these applications, enter information. It pops up in the map. So they are very much encouraged to interact with these with staff and with uh, local planning folks as well. Just got. To. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I can maybe. Go. You're our hero today. Thank you. <laughs> what, a, what a great job of. Trimming it down, but still getting to the essentials. Any questions from our members? Chair Smith, one very quick question. So, uh, what kinds of um, folks or organizations are coming to you with interest in these watershed plans? Are these local governments or conservation groups? Uh, they are all of the above. We're working with the French Broad River Partnership that includes Asheville Regional Office staff. They've been very active and interested in developing these plans. Coastal Federation, we're working with them in several plan areas, and the COGS also have developed capacity. And we interact directly with them in developing these plans as well. They've developed, uh, I think, three of these already. So we're not doing all the lift in house. So we have a lot of cooperators outside. Town of Wilson has done one on their own that goes well beyond a stormwater uh, program. So we're expecting to have more and more of that type of activity as we move forward. When these plans are in place, does it give them? any clout as they apply for grant money or including 
infrastructure money that is so coming in. When we started this process 10 years ago, I went to all of our funding groups and they basically are giving extra points to any people that are implementing one of these plans. And in order to get 319 money, you have to have one. So that's step one to even get to the 319. And I've heard of some other private funding sources that are also uh, giving a lot of consideration to projects that are within these plant areas outside of water projects. Like we had the one in Wilson that started off as a as a HUD project and turned into a, a pretty good water quality restoration project as well. And, and these are restoration plants. So are we tracking and documenting when restoration is achieved? That is one of the most important aspects of this is to not only get to the in the in the water monitoring restoration, but we've developed several tools to track incremental success at a very small scale. We're talking almost at the rain barrel scale to show progress very little bits at a time because there's some of these some of these are on a 50 year horizon, the planning horizon. So we need to be able to show incremental success every year and we've developed tools to be able to track that and report that very quickly and easily. Is that going? Is that publicly available? Will this be posted, for example, as your? It will be. It will be a component of the plan itself. You didn't see it, but the very bottom tab it says effectiveness monitoring, and it goes straight to that part of how are we doing? Great, great. Um, my my only other question is the um, the diagram of changes from the 2020 assessment. If I try and do the math on how the arrows and the numbers in the arrows are moving back and forth. It seems to appear it appears to be like a degradation is occurring. There's increased degradation. I don't know whether that's just as a result of the new it, methodology it is, or, or it is noisy. Uh, one of the things that does happen when we go out and establish new monitoring sites, it's generally because we already know there's something going on. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our new monitoring sites end up going straight to the 303D list. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of those. And that 199 moving to data inconclusive, that is based on a, a narrow statistical window that's part of the listing and delisting method. And that is one sample could go the other way. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're sit on that threshold. So you have, when you're looking at basically 24 samples of new data, you have one or two samples can flip that the other way. So we, the, those arrows are generally leaning the other direction last time. Okay. I continue to see PCBs in the new listings, but they have a date of like 2008 or 2004. What, can you explain why it's in the new listings table, but it has an old date? Uh, that one might be because we increased the extent of the area, but it, and it's so technically it looks like a new listing, but it was an increase in the extent of area after. We have to go back and forth with HHS on the extent of where the fish are in the risk, and it's not just, it's not based on our monitoring. So we've been refining those over the years as we looked at more fish tissue and also got more advice from HHS about where the fish are potentially being consumed. So I would, I would expect that we're going to have a kind of quite a few changes uh, in the extents of assessment units, the mileage and acreage, because we're going through a remapping process right now to make the maps of the streams and estuaries and re reservoirs be more realistic to what's on the ground, and that is going to greatly increase the mileage of streams that we're tracking in the state, and also better shorelines. So, for example, the PCB problem in Crabtree Creek or Lake Crabtree, that's an historic issue, right? There's no new PCB discharge? But no, not that we're aware of. That, that All of the ones that we're aware of are legacy. Now, some of them, they haven't found a site but they, their legacy and the show started to show up in the fish tissue as we were monitoring. Okay. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. It's always uh, good to hear about the progress with this. Thank you. And we'll look forward to seeing links to the videos. Thank you. That ends our presentations for today. Um, I would ask if there are um, any questions about the EMC meeting agenda tomorrow. I don't recall, if we, I don't think we really have any water quality issues on the agenda tomorrow.
I have to go back and check. I don't think we do. Uh, I've distributed to our members just a working document. So it's a living document of our our wish list and where things stand uh, with our progress. I think we've made good progress in the past two years. There's always more to do, but that's just for your for your use and reference. And please let me know if there are any new topics that you think we need to begin to address. Um, again, we welcome Richard Rogers to join us. Do you have any comments for us today? Any reports? No additional comments at okay. this moment. Okay, thank you. Any remarks from our members? I think we heard an E. coli update today. The other thing that we asked for in um, in March at full EMC and in committee is moving on the uh, silver toxicity, ecotoxicity rule. We did not ask for a calendar for progress on that, but I am told that the division is working on that. So uh, we appreciate that. That was going to require a literature review, I believe. So if there is no more business, I will adjourn the meeting and this committee will reconvene in July. Thank you. Thank you.